to Boston Basic Income. This week, we have special guests Aaron James and Bob Hockett joining us to talk about their new book, Money from Nothing, or Why We Should Stop Worrying About the Debt and Learn to Love the Federal Reserve. Uh, so this is a really interesting book. Um, these guys have somewhat of an MMT perspective, and we've talked about MMT in here before. They're a little more sympathetic to basic income, a lot more sympathetic to basic income than a lot of the MMT people that you hear out there. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here, you know, pretty much every chapter. I was like, ah, yes, this is really amazing. This is really important. I really love this. But also in every chapter, there was something like, wow, I could sit down and spend hours arguing with this, these guys about this. So we should have a really uh, interesting discussion in store for us tonight. Um, I want to start by going around the room, and if you have an opening thought, um, raise your hand. The question is going to be, uh, what is the promise that money represents, and how is that promise fulfilled? So in here, a lot of times we talk about money being a promise. Um, so what kind of promise is it? And since nobody has their hands up, we are going to go straight to Aaron and then Bob. Go ahead, Aaron. Bob, do you want to start on that, start on the legal sort of dimensions of that, the nature of the promise and money? Okay, we're going to go to Bob. Yeah. I do that. Okay, unmuted, am I? Yes. Great, great. So um, in a way, it's a sort of, you can think of a, of a money as a kind of circulating generic promise or a sort of a, it's a sort of an abstract um, proof of or expression of obligation or indebtedness. Um, that's to sort of speak at a kind of high level of generality, obviously. Um, when we get more specific, you kind of have to get more legal, which is sort of interesting about this. And I think this is one reason why people with a bit of a political philosophic background or a legal background or both generally understand money better, I think, than economists do. So uh, the, the easiest way, I think, to sort of concretize this is to sort of do the move that Aaron and I often do, which is to invite people to pull a dollar bill or a five dollar bill out of your pocket. And if you read across the top, um, you'll read the phrase Federal Reserve Note. Um, that note abbreviates uh, the phrase uh, promissory note. So it's essentially an, it's a, an evidence of a promissory obligation. Now, when it's a Federal Reserve note, it's a very generic sort of promise. In the past, it might have represented a claim on 35 or 0.35 ounces of gold uh, or something of that sort. Um, but now it really just represents, in effect, uh, a promise by the sovereign to recognize any payment that you make with that particular currency as actually discharging your obligation. This is one reason um, that we see that, that mysterious phrase, legal tender, and the sort of longer phrase, sometimes good for all obligations, uh, public and private. So it's a sort of a generic kind of claim to have discharged uh, any particular obligation that you might have that is quantifiable you might say. Uh, again, this is still at a fairly high level of generality, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get around to sort of getting to how one builds up from sort of more individual sort of person to person, um, sort of binary or bilateral uh, promissory obligations to these more generic forms of that obligation that are uh, sovereign monies. Okay, so before we go to Aaron, I'm going to add more to the question, uh, which is that in the book, you guys talk about um, overpromising and underpromising. Mm -hmm. So the idea that uh, if the government overpromises, then they issue too much money, they make too many promises, and then that causes inflation. Underpromising, uh, you have deflation. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there a promise there with respect to price stability? But then also in the book, you guys talk about money as a tax credit. So the government is promising to accept um, tax payments in the form of these, these money tokens that they issue. Mm -hmm. So is one of these promises more fundamental than the other? Um, if you have, uh, if you make one promise, uh, but not the other one, is it money or something like, or, or, or does it have to be both? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a conflict there? Uh, or, or do these things naturally synergize with each other? 
Great, great. Yeah, thanks. Great question. So um, I actually think the tax fulfillment um, role of money is actually kind of subsidiary. And that's actually one thing that I think differentiates uh, Aaron and me from the MMTers. Uh, if you had to kind of categorize us, uh, I think the easiest way to do this would be to say that the generic term or the genus is endogenous money theorists, right? People who view money is something that is endogenously generated in the same way that promises themselves are endogenously issued. And then there are various sort of sub schools within that more general sort of school. The MMTers are one of the sort of subcategories of endogenous money theorists. And in that sense, they're sort of siblings uh, to Aaron and me or cousins to Aaron and me, um, but they're definitely cousins. They're not the same category you might say. And this is one of the places, along with UBI, um, where that sort of shows up. So the MMTers tend to emphasize, at least insofar as you can generalize, they tend to emphasize the role that money plays as, again, as a sort of tax receipt, as you, as you noted. Um, that's an important role that money plays. But Aaron and I believe that you can think of that itself as simply a special case of a much more general case, which is, a, again, a sort of evidence of having discharged an obligation, which then itself can be used to discharge an obligation. And tax obligations are only one of many kinds of obligation that one might have, right? Um, you might have noticed, or you might have uh, gotten a kick out of the little story that we tell in the book where Aaron and Bob are brothers, and then later there's a sister in the family. Yeah, who's Catherine, by the way? Uh, that's Catherine. Yeah, perfect, right? And so they start trading prom they start basically trading promises with each other. And a kind of money system sort of grows out of that. And there, there's no, you know, something like a tax obligation comes along later in the form of chores, but you didn't have to have chores or tax obligations at all. All you had to have was obligation simpliciter. All I had to do was owe Aaron something or Aaron had to owe me something. And then once you bring a third party into it, if I can start directing Aaron who owes me to pay Catherine instead of paying me, then we've been effect monetized the obligation in that very act. And you can think of a sovereign money or a money that's used within a polity or a sort of sub-political unit like a society, let's say, or a proto-polity as essentially something between a kind of fully developed sovereign currency on the one hand and that kind of very proto-proto-proto currency that was the sort of first step toward monetizing obligations in the Aaron, Catherine, and Bob story on the other hand. That more or less makes sense. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. I'll we'll probably clarify it further. Oh, yeah. Do I have to unmute? No. No, you're unmuted. Okay. Um, yeah, just to add a couple of philosophical points. One is that that um, this this sort of favor economy that we describe, it's a credit debt cooperative, and we're keeping track of what we owe each other. That's that's a way of fleshing out um, a, a point that uh, Innes Mitchell Innes makes against Adam Smith. Um, in his 1913 paper. And it's like, a, I think of it as a pretty devastating refutation of Adam Smith on money, mm -hmm. despite the fact that Adam Smith's view, uh, sort of seen as a commodity view, has kind of become, became standard within orthodox theory and is still taught in textbooks and everything. So, I mean, um, um, you know, it's like there's a double, like uh, there's the inconveniences of bartered exchange. And then because uh, it could be that, you know, it's it, you have to find somebody who has what you what you want and wants what you have, and that's difficult to do. Um, we have to find adopt a convention where we get a third thing that that people generally want, like gold or whatever, and then use that as a medium of exchange, right? So, but Innes makes this point that like, no, look, that was never necessary historically, and it's just. And Smith says, without that further thing, there's no possibility of exchange between them. What mm -hmm. Innes says is, no, there's absolutely a possibility of exchange. You don't need to agree on a common thing. You just create these promises, create a debt obligation, make it transferable. You could have a, a credit debt cooperative. It could expand. It's sort of like what we have is like a model of that, of how that would work out. And banking could be built off of that as well. So none of that requires the state. So that 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 puts us sort of in different from a chartalist from an, or pure state money theory, theory, which thinks that state issuance is required for, for something to be a bona fide money. Um, but once you bring in the state, then it, it does have this distinctive role. And then focusing on the, the promissory nature of, of government money is Im important because it demystifies, um, it cre clears up certain philosophical mysteries like about a fiat money system. You might think, how could money, you know, it's supposed to have value at, at, and how could that just be sort of created by fiat by some government official just saying, you know, like, okay, dollars, you know, or you know, just saying any declaration or whatever, right? 
um, how could that have value? It shouldn't, doesn't have to be backed, as they say, by something real, you know, like gold, something solid, something unchangeable, you know, like, you know, um, it doesn't need something more metaphysically significant in order to really be valuable as money. It's um, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, but if you but, think but about- It's yeah. tempting to throw something in really quickly here yeah, that, um, that people with philosophic backgrounds will recognize at once, certainly Aaron uh, will. Um, as you know, in the philosophy of language, there's something sometimes referred to as the context principle, which is basically to the effect that a word only has a meaning within the context of a sentence or even within a broader set of linguistic practices, right? Um, I think a mistake that a lot of people make about money uh, is to sort of think of tokens of money a bit like words taken out of sentences or taken out of communicative context, right? If you remind yourself that a money is always contextualized in the sense it is simply that which pays in a payment system or that which counts, right, in a practice of valuing things and in, again, discharging obligations, then it becomes immediately obvious why you don't need some precious metal or some sort of state issuance or whatever. You could have a ledger, for example, very easily. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence to the effect that the first monies were basically just ledger entries. And we moved to tokens when societies grew too large to keep everything on a single account book. And one way of looking at contemporary crypto developments and fintech developments is that we've developed the technology to sort of return to ledgers. And we're sort of in a sense, in a sense, in the midst right now of you know, going back to ledgers. And in that sense, you could describe our monetary history as from ledgers to tokens and back. And that's where we are now as we're going back to ledgers. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. so I mean, you can think of our current situation, central bank, central banking is sort of manage, it's a letting private banks manage the payment system, but, um, but with new ledger technology, the central bank can, can take more control over it. Right, and that gives you possibilities that that of like issuing basic income payments, for example, that um, more efficiently than than um, than we can now do it. But the the, the reason the, the the government can do that, or central bank can can do that partly, just because it has authority on behalf of you know the whole society, the whole republic, based on its authoritative issuances, just to just to issue government promises, right, to extend the full faith and credit of the. Of the society, why can it do that? Like, well, it can do it just in the same way that you or I can make a promise to show up to this meeting, right? That we have authority, promissory authority about our future whereabouts, and so when I, under the right circumstances, um, perform the speech act, I promise see you there. <laughs> you know, like, you know um, that then creates an obligation, um, you know, for me, um, a, which is a liability for me. It, for, to the person I made the promise to, it creates a claim against me that I appear. It creates an asset for them if you're doing the bookkeeping, you know, um, um, and that's, that's, if you think about ordinary life, we do that all the time. And that's what makes life work is those kinds of, that's all the good things of life happen is because these promises are basically getting us coordinating our activities, right? Um, um, and we're keeping track of those promises. That's why we rely on them. They're as real socially as anything else. Mm -hmm. So, um, but how could it be? You might get in a moment of perplexity, like, but how could it be just by my say so? I just say these words, I promise, and this thing comes into existence, a claim and an obligation and an asset and a liability. And how is it like how could how could the mere say so like change the sort of normative landscape in that way? Uh, well, you can make it seem mysterious, but it's as ordinary as anything is like saying, yeah. I promise yeah. giving a warning, uh, saying I now pronounce you man and wife, you know. So from a speech act theory point of view, it's like just sort of central to all of life and language. Yeah, will you marry me? Yeah, so, uh, the Fed officials are doing that same thing. So you think of those typing in credits into, into typing in I do. accounts. They're <laughs> typing in those IOUs, they're basically just making, prom those are like promissory acts, like I promise, I promise. <laughs> yeah, that changes, they changes type in a billion, you know, right. it's a billion <laughs> promissory credits. You know, yeah. Like, you know, like, so it demystifies what's going on in a fiat money system. So in terms of the of the promise that the government is making or the promise that the Fed is making, would it be accurate for me to say that the government is promising that you'll be able to claim a certain amount of goods and services from the economy um, with these tokens, that these tokens are claim tickets for a standard amount of stuff. Yeah. And the and by fulfilling that promise means uh, ensuring that 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 um, that that amount remains fairly consistent over time. Yeah. And you can say that the modulatory task that the central bank that the central bank discharges, that's to say modulating the value of money by basically 
changing the amount in circulation or changing the velocity um, in order to basically sort of counteract inflation or deflation is a way of maintaining that promise. It's a kind of a temporally extended promise. Um, and the thing it bears noting again, just to bring context into it again, that it's part of a system so that the Fed alone isn't doing all of this legal tender law, for example, plays a pretty important role as well. Basically, people are required by law to accept these Federal Reserve notes in discharge of obligations. And in that sense, our republic itself has made a promise, or we, as a, in a, in a kind of in our joint capacity as the citizenry, have made a kind of promise to ourselves in both our joint and our several capacities that these particular issuances will count in discharge of obligations. They will clear and settle uh, uh, transactions. Uh, and the Fed's part in this is mainly, at present at least, to modulate the currency amount or velocity again in order to maintain the, kind, the value of it, which is a part of that promise, but it's not the whole of the promise. Okay, yeah. Uh, sometimes in here we talk about the Fed modulating the flow of spending in the economy. So you have the flow of goods and services going in one direction and the flow of spending going in the other direction. Uh, and then it's about keeping those things balanced with each other to, to maintain price stability. And, and as you said, it's more than just the Fed. It's the entire um, you know, framework. You know, A lot of things determine uh, the not only the level of spending, but the pattern of spending and whether it matches up with the pattern of, of, of output. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get back to something Aaron said a moment ago uh, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. I wanted to just a couple, like on the point of uh, seeing inflation as as the Fed's role in management, managing the overall level of commitment. That's analogous to a person. A lot, you know, we all make lots of promises, and then we can't make too many of them. We can't make too few, or our lives are impoverished. You know, but because we need all these relationships, but we can't too, make too many either because um, yeah. we're, we're overbooked and we can't do every, can't keep all the agreements. And then if we don't keep, if we don't fulfill that's equivalent to devaluation you know of our word and that's so structurally that's the same thing as what the fed's doing for the whole country but the fed is in a very special position different from you or i because it's it's also interacting with a whole economy a whole you know productive uh system as well um and and you might think of the deeper philosophical second this gets at some, a point you asked alex which is which is there's a system that gets created but does it have to make this promise what's the right so there's a tax liability imposed. So the government says you have a debt to us to give us back. And that's specified, you know, sort of in a unit of account, you have to give us back dollars and, and nothing else will do. But could you could imagine, you could imagine a, a kind of more dictatorial society, maybe something like an ancient grain king or whatever I think about, where the grain king just lays down these laws, you have to give us back a certain amount of grain, a certain amount of dollars. Um, and it's it's not, it's it's sort of a threat promise. It's sort of like, um, if you don't give us back these tokens, tokens, we'll throw you in jail. If you do give us back the tokens, we still might throw you in jail. <laughs> but we, we'll be, it's just up to us. But we might but your best chances of avoiding <laughs> jail are to give us back the tokens, right? And so people might in fact do it, but there's still no sort of promise um, in the issuance of the tokens. They're sort of just making... Now like that, you, that kind of situation, you might think is sort of a morally illegitimate form of rule um, that's, you know, we've long, you know, that's long now seen as illegitimate. Um, and so, but certainly in a republic, we think that the government has to, it can't just make a threat, a threat promise in this way. Like, you know, it has to, it has to actually say, okay, here's your debt to society. Here's how it could be paid in principle in this unit of account. And then they have to actually issue that unit and then promise to accept it back to, in settlement of the debt. And if they don't do that, that's a deep kind of illegitimacy, you know, um, I mean, think about it just, for example, a government that um, uh, makes the promise, but it doesn't create enough money so that everybody can fulfill the tax obligation, right? That would delegitimize it too, right? In the sense that people might revolt or switch to another money or, you know, something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, like the very legitimacy of a government, you might say, is at stake. It, it has to sort of uh, make this promise um, as well. So it, it's there's some moral dynamics there and the sort of yeah you know, long since overcome that we take for granted that um, that explain why well and that relates to the idea of a social contract too because what does it take for a government to be legitimate in the eyes of its subjects well it has to create enough money so that they can fulfill the debts that it's owed society it has to make sure that that money spread around enough so that enough parties can get a hold of it um, and if the if 
One way of doing that is in saying, well, we're going to have an economy where you have to work for money. And so the only way to get the money is by doing a job that somebody's willing to pay you for, right? Um, now, you might think that has certain legitimacy problems too. That's not the best social contract. Maybe it works okay overall, but it doesn't work in lots of other ways. One argument for our basic income, for example, is to say, no, look, that arrangement isn't working well enough. And um, a way to preserve the legitimacy of even the monetary system is to just make sure people have the money um, directly, just extend the credit to them, the credits, the dollar credits uh, to them so they can live and, and fulfill their societal obligations. That's a more legitimate and more stable, more just. I'm using that word advisedly, by the way, because I heard <laughs> <doing moral philosophy. laughs> yeah. a more just arrangement. Yeah, but you could see that as tying, coming from a sort of considerations of legitimacy that requ that require a social contract and require a monetary system that matches it um, in a certain way. And so what we're proposing is sort of fits within that as a solution to that problem. Yeah, I, I like this idea of government legitimacy and the idea that, you know, if the government isn't doing what it's supposed to do in representing the collective interests of the people, et cetera, then the people can hold the government to account. Uh, so that can raise the question, what are the constraints that a government faces in order to uh, maintain legitimacy as the government? Uh, what are the constraints that the currency faces in order for the people to continue using that currency? Like you can talk about the threat of throwing people in jail, but if you have, if the government says you have to pay your taxes in, you know, some weird crazy unit that's flying all over the place in terms of value or something like that, and they're not making any effort to keep it stable, uh, then, you know, maybe people use something else as their currency and they just, you know, uh, they just uh, uh, exchange into the into whatever the government token is come tax day or something like that. So it feels like there are constraints on how money has to work uh, that go beyond the law and that go beyond the government. Like the law and the government face constraints themselves. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think so. I mean, um, you know, I, I guess I tend to think of all of this as I always think of the law here as an emanation of something that precedes the law, something that's kind of proto-law. Uh, and proto-law would then be sets of practices that people develop uh, that begin to kind of harden into sort of normative uh, sort of expectations, mutual expectations that have a kind of normative valence to them, that it becomes kind of obligatory or quasi-obligatory for people to act in certain ways. And then when societies grow large enough and complex enough that you have to sort of formalize and regularize certain basic practices that have a normative valence, then we call it law and we make it into law. Um, but in, it's, it's, it's a helpful way, I think, of thinking about the role of the law in a case like this, because it enables you to go back to first principles then very quickly and easily when trying to figure out, well, what else has to be in place um, for a, a currency system to work? You know, what else in addition to law? And I think maybe the easiest or sort of shorthand uh, way of characterizing what has to be in place in addition to the law is, again, that set of practices that typically precedes formalized or regularized law, right? In other words, the kinds of practices that precede and then ultimately harden and become formalized as law, right? So in that sense, you can think of the law as kind of officially memorializing something that has already become a kind of unwritten law, a set of practices which hardens into custom. Uh, and indeed, I think that law is quite, you know, kind of continuous with custom, which is in turn continuous with practices, right? So um, if you think of it that way, then what you could say is, look, if you took away all of the stuff that the law formalized or regularized in the first place, if you took all of that stuff away, it would be a little bit like that kind of chocolate coating around an ice cream cone without the ice cream anymore, you know? And so it would just kind of crack and just kind of collapse pretty quickly and easily if you didn't have that kind of underlying sort of set of practices and interactions between persons. And I guess this is sort of a long-witted way of saying that uh, a functioning currency system presupposes something a bit like what the great Scottish Enlightenment philosophers would have referred to as civil society, something that's kind of pre-state or proto-state, um, and then stays in place and continues to kind of buttress and support the state. That, of course, finds it, its way into 19th century German philosophy, too, notably in Hegel, uh, who seems to have learned a lot of it from the Scots. 
Um, so I think all of that is still very much true, right? Even though we tend to forget about that stuff and overlook it now because who reads Ferguson any longer or who reads Sir James Stewart or for that matter, who reads Hegel or even Tocqueville any longer? Okay, well, I have not read them, so so that is a is a good there rhetorical question there. <laughs> uh, I could sit here asking you guys questions all day, but Austin has his hand up, so let's go to Austin. Hey, Alex, thanks. Um, first of all, this is great. Like, I love this conversation so far. Um, I actually studied philosophy uh, and politics at university, and then got into economics because I realized oh, actually I got a job in journalism, and everything that you're reporting on is about economics. So you have to understand it, but I still tend to come at it. Um, someone said that, you know, they want to unpick the economic, uh, well, in, inform philosophy with economics. I think I'm also always more interested in forming or looking at the, the philosophical assumptions inside economics, which I think is sometimes understated. I, I'm going to just quickly have a, a dig at Alex's intro where he says um, the, uh, that we should go beneath what's uh, just and fair and look at what's harmful and, um, and, and beneficial um, and point out that that itself is taking a utilitarian philosophical position, um, which can be, so he's, I think to some extent, he's doing what a lot of economists do and making philosophical assumptions that he hasn't fully interrogated um, as much, which can be, which could be, you know, helpful. Um, and when I first put my hand up, I was, going to say, so, pardon me, I'm walking up a mountain in Australia um, at the moment. Oh, um, putting up to yeah. shame. I feel yeah. guilty. Well, it's, it's the morning here and I'm, I do my morning exercise while I, while I listen to Boston Basic Income um, mm. uh, because I run an Australian Basic Income oh, group. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I steal Alex's ideas for that. Um, so, but what I was going to say is at the beginning, it seemed like you guys were operating in an almost purely sort of Rawlsian social contract space where it's all about promises and obligations and communicative, what um, uh, Habermas would call communicative reason, um, right? Where, there's, where we're all having this wonderful discussion and, and giving each other freely made agreements without the presence of force. And, I've, and since I put my hand up, you know, the idea of the emperor king throwing people into jail if they don't pay their taxes in the right currency has come up. So you've kind of stolen my thunder. But what I was going to say is I feel like Maybe you guys, I haven't read your work yet. I'm very interested too, if I can get through the other 20 books that I haven't read yet that I've already lined up. Um, the, the other, but it seems like it's sort of 90% roles and 10% a more critical, uh, less um, optimistic view of the, of the state. And I'm uh, quite, quite taken by what Carl Weiderquist, who uh, Alex gets on this, discussion group a fair bit says, you know, that there was no moment of social contract. It was thrust on people with military force. And I think that's really important in understanding currency. Like in the context of the global economy, we all use the US dollar because you guys, you know, have the biggest military. And before that, the British had the biggest military, so we used the British pound. And in Australia, we all drive on the left-hand side of the road because the government said so. Now, if the government disappeared overnight, you know, they were all killed in a mass assassination campaign. Um, we'd probably keep driving on the left-hand side of the road, right? At least until society broke down and it was, it was Mad Max. But um, even in Mad Max, I think they drive on the left-hand side of the road, right? The conventions exist, but underneath that, like the, 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 the state of, the state's use of force is like the goalie, right? Like it's the final linchpin to me that holds it all together. And I guess... I, I, it's a belt and suspenders situation where both things are in play and you kind of want both. You want a state that's going to guarantee it, guarantee the, the currency and you want people to accept it in the marketplace. But I just wonder if that's, um, if that's sort of more critical that, you know. Still there, uh, Austin? Oh, it looked like you were, it sounded like you were getting right to the, to the, to the, he the of your question. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, Austin, we'll come back to you in a minute if you get reconnected. Uh, so go ahead, go ahead, Aaron. Aaron uh, I, mean, I can answer. I hear you. Kind of musical. Now. 
it's sort of electrical. So one of the things I'm not happy about with Zoom is that if you try to mute someone and having connection problems, the action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not necessary. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about this, you guys. Can you send me a message in the chat? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so this is this is the rest of it's going to be like by the way you guys okay there we go <laughs> uh so uh aaron do you want to go ahead and um speak to to the points that austin brought up oh i could i guess well, he can listen to the recording later too i i suppose um yeah um yeah well a couple things um I mean, there doesn't have to be an actual contract, right, to, for there to be a sort of implicit or a social contract. I mean, but one way to think about a, what a social contract would be is what would legitimize um, in the eyes of the people who are expected to go along with it, the way that the state is coercing us to do lots of things. But state coercion is sort of, and including, you know, via money and taxes is one of the sort of key arms, but there's also the larger set of social structures and culture and expectations that are organized our, our lives in profound ways that have profound influence on our whole life prospects. Um, and that all needs to be justified uh, as well. Uh, so what's a form of that, a social contract that we can all sort of in principle get on uh, board with, we can find reasonably acceptable. That's a Rawlsian way of putting it. And um, um, that's consistent with what we argue uh, in the book. And it's different from a utilitarian view in the sense that you don't just ask, well, let's just figure out what would promote the greatest welfare in the aggregate and then just have whatever action society institutions just maximize that where we don't sort of draw interpretively from an understanding of the kind of thing we already have. Mm -hmm. So the, our, our arguments from, you know, the, the kind of institutions we already have, their purposes, the, the purposes of the Fed, you know, like those kinds of more legal uh, institutional arguments are all sort of more backward looking and drawing from, you know, understood purpose and principle and then making the most sense out of it and going from there. So that's, that's a contrast with the utilitarian. It doesn't mean that you, we can't still Sort of in certain contexts, like use more aggregative thought, you know, trying to do the best, get the best outcome for things. But now, just to note, like Rawls himself was against a basic income grant, partly for reciprocity reasons. So, he, and the one place in his whole corpus in which he mentioned a location was Malibu Beach, where he said that the Malibu surfer, you know, who spends his all, all day surfing, um, shouldn't get, you know, any any special assistance. He shouldn't get a basic income payment. And then so he could then spend the day surfing, he should be asked to work. And any time he didn't spend working, he would get that benefit in leisure time. And that would sort of, as it were, even out whatever money he would have gained. So it was sort of, he's very, he doesn't have any claim against us. But I think now this is, this is only quickly alluded to in the, in the book later on, but, but um, you can see Rawls is wrong about that. Not in the way that Philippe Van Parish thought that he was wrong, which is that that um, that's discriminating between the against the conserver conception of the good life as as against the workaholic or as a for in favor of the workaholic sort of imp imposing workaholism on all of us as against the surfer not that but just that the, just you can say this that look there's a lot the surfer by spending the day surfing can be seen as contributing to society in lots of ways just even having a non-consumptive life a greener lifestyle for example that contributes to society there's lots of ways that aren't remun aren't um, rewarded in money in money, you know, raising children or, or, or doing lots of things, service to society, you know, going to elderly um, houses, you know, like lots of things are artistic pursuits that are broadly speaking contributions to society. And that for reciprocity reasons, a social contract should include those as contributions for which we could give people a basic income payment so they can make those kinds of things more feasible. Even if they want to work part-time, for example, you know, because of a job guarantee or because of something else, you know, a basic income payment would be good to make, put together, so people can put together sort of a package of, you know, put together a life that's just sort of great for them. You know, like that's a way that um, we can make good on their contributions to us as a society and give something they can, that we, we can all get behind and be excited about. Um, so that, you know, to the extent that the system is coercive and forcing us to do things, we can think, okay, yeah, but, we're on board with it. I can uphold it. You know, I don't need to get um, angry at immigrants and, you know, and, and vote for a demagogue who's going <laughs> to demonize the immigrants to blame all, you know, et cetera. 
and that stabilizes. So we get stability and greater justice as a result. I'll just I'll just add really quickly for for, for Austin's uh, sake, uh, maybe just two quick things. Uh, the first is that um, I don't really actually consider myself a, a, a Rawlsian, um, but I guess I am a kind of a Rousseauian, you might say. And there's a there is a difference, believe it or not. Um, and there's a paper I have floating around out there just called Rousseauian money. Uh, if anybody wants to find it, just Google Rousseauian money, it'll turn up. Um, but I think that the Rousseauian sort of take on contract theory is in some ways more interesting, at least to me, than than the Rawlsian uh, take. Um, and it's interesting in a particular way that I think enables me then to say another thing about what Austin said, and that is, and this actually dovetails with what Aaron said as well, um, the whole point of thinking in kind of contractarian terms or mutual obligatory uh, terms in this context isn't to provide a kind of a history or a putative history as to how things actually went down or how things actually happened. It's more to sort of, um, it's a way of illuminating uh, an underlying structure of a set of practices. And in some cases it can also serve as a way of justifying a set of practices, right? If you can sort of describe or plausibly interpret a set of practices in sort of as if terms, it's as if this contract had been entered into, or it's as if this set of, of mutuality practices had evolved and developed and then ultimately hardened into formal form in, in, in the sense, in, the, in the, the form of a body of laws uh, administered by a state that is legitimately the agent of a collective agent, basically the agent of a collective principle, let's say, namely all of us in our joint capacity as a single we, a kind of a single political we, rather than a bunch of separate political eyes, then it makes that set of practices look more acceptable. It serves to sort of help legitimize them, right? And that's actually one sentence in which I do find the, the sort of the Rousseauian take on contractarianism, if we're going to call it that, somewhat more interesting, um, because I, I, I'm quite into this idea uh, of the distinctions between ourselves in our joint capacity, which is shared, uh, and ourselves in our several capacities, to use le legal lingo here, which are individual, right? That's to say, I'm quite taken with the idea of a political we um, and, and the significance of it. And I suppose that's a version of what, what Rousseau was trying to get at with the idea of a general will. Now, I'm aware of all the dangers of tyranny and all the other stuff that come, come with that, but I don't think I'm committed to any of that stuff in this particular take on things. Final point is um, Austin's observation that the state and its coercive capacity is a kind of linchpin. That might be true. And furthermore, it might be true in some periods and less true in other periods. There might be periods where you need more sort of law and order, so to speak, or you need a Rudy Giuliani to be mayor of New York City at some times in history. And then there might be other times when he's a complete disaster as mayor of New York City. But the point is that either way, whether they, whether it's true or not, that sometimes you need more force and sometimes you need less, you still need something apart from that or beyond that or more than that. And that gets back to what we talked about a few minutes ago when I sort of trotted out Tocqueville and the, and the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers and the civil society theorists, right? You need some kind of set of practices and expectations that we all form um, relative to one another so that things are kind of almost could almost operate on their own. And then the state comes in as an optimizer, as a kind of fine tuner to kind of make sure that everything sort of stays within the bounds. But, but there's a fair bit of kind of spontaneous private ordering that plays a role, I think, in any functioning system. Um, and in that sense, I think even if Austin's right, that you need the coercive power as a linchpin, there's still something that is linchpinned. You know what I mean? There are still bricks that are linchpinned um, and you can't do without those. The linchpin alone isn't gonna do you any good at all. Okay, uh, I wanna give Austin a really quick a chance to follow up. Go ahead, Austin. Austin, you're muted. All right, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, just a footnote. This is like a sorry. I've I just put my I was busy typing my comment in the chat. So if Alex wants to read that in case my connection goes again, that would be my response. Okay, why don't you? Okay, I will read it. Um, so he says, I am advocating neither a utilitarian or Rawlsian view, but more a continental take, which problematizes this and focuses on the ugliest realities of power. Yes, Rousseau would be more compatible with my view. My fear is being too generous in legitimizing existing power relations, mm -hmm. though I think you guys are using it for the opposite reason. Mm 
Oh, yeah, this actually fits with my footnote on my research. So like Bob's explication of Rousseau is is actually, I mean, my one of my better papers, a 2005 paper in philosophy of public affairs, argues that, that Rawls's whole corpus can be understood as doing roughly what he, what he described. So it's called it the Hegelian, it's emphasized the Hegelian aspects in Rawls. And then you get to sort of where, um, where uh, what Bob was what was saying, and then I've I, I've developed that into a practice-based method of justification, and then my book on fairness in the global economy uses that same method. Um, but but here this gets to a point about that Austin just raised about whether that's too conservative, in a way that utilitarianism is not. U utilitarianism is like takes nothing for granted, and everything's just to be optimized according to the great, greatest overall welfare, um, um, the, just the aggregate. But uh, but. Um, if in taking for granted and sort of looking to practice, even for ideas about how things can be organized, very general form, is that taking too much for granted? So there's a kind of conservatism worry about worry in there. Um, so I've had to address that a lot in my academic uh, work. So I, just to say it's a real, it's a real issue. Um, and my answer is roughly, well, there's certain types of ideas of justice that aren't conservative in that way and others that allow a certain amount of backward looking out to it. And then what's really interesting to me is are the forms that are where there is practice sensitivity is appropriate. If you can draw from things that we understand or background practice and show that that has really deep and, and fairly radical implications, then that's really interesting. So that's like what we're doing in the book, really. It's like ours is an example of that. It's like, oh, well, you, you think you thought you understood what the Fed and the central bank um, is. You thought you understood money. Well, no, actually, um, by the way, economists haven't thought about it very much or like, well, stop thinking about it. Um, and once you sort of reflect upon just the purposes of the institutions, the principles of them, and you think about how their purposes would be extended into like today's problems, then you get pretty dramatic, um, uh, dramatic revisions to the banking system um, of a very appealing kind that make good on our Republican ideals, small r democratic ideals and ideas of equality and, and stuff like that. So once you get a sort of a, a payoff, a sort of, that's a really big, interesting payoff, but you can, but you start drawing from practice and implicit ideas, you know, that's to me is like a really appealing form of argument in political philosophy. It's not pure utopianism because it's looking back, but it's, but it has a lot of the, the advantages of the nice things about utopianism because it's still sort of, I don't know, emancipatory or open or, you know, kind of, you know, and um, radical relative to maybe the current sense of what's politically possible. Um, but not so far out that it's not sort of consistent with our institutions and our under self understandings. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, you brought up the institutions again, and in terms of the role that the institutions fulfill, I'm wondering about um, kind of what the raw functional purpose of money is. What is the, the function that it serves in our society? And an analogy I like to use sometimes is the analogy to language. So we all have to speak the same standard language in order to communicate with each other. And in some sense, money is, is the language of trade. We all have to set prices in a common standard so you know they can adjust efficiently and we can pay those prices in uh, standard tokens so we know that we're paying the price appropriately, that kind of thing. So um, my, my thinking here is that um, money is is two things. It's the standard unit, and then it's the standard tokens that uh, we spend in order to claim in order to claim goods and services. And any any market economy, any kind of like large scale system of trade, uh, is going to need something like that. So, would you say that it's accurate that the institutions uh, emerged to kind of fulfill this? Um, function uh, to provide a, a, a stable um, standard uh, for the economy to use so the economy can operate efficiently. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I can take a first crack at it. Um, I think it's, it's, that's a fair characterization. Um, maybe there, there are two additional things I think are worth noting in that connection that kind of complement your, your picture. Um, and in complementing it, they kind of enrich it. So if we, if we begin with the notion of just obligation, right, and this could be promissory obligation, but it needn't be, right? If I commit a wrong against Aaron, so I just owe him, I owe you one because I, I harmed him in some way. So I owe him some kind of compensation. We have to develop some means by which I can discharge that obligation. Then if I start making promises to Aaron as well, then that's yet another ground of obligation. I have to 
fulfill the promise. And thus far, there's no commerce in any of this in any sort of literal sense of commerce the way we use it now. Now, if we think of commerce as simply just yet another form of promissory obligation that comes along later, and it maybe starts as the tail of the dog, and in time it grows large enough to sort of wag the dog, as it were, you know, to use that tired metaphor. So, you know, you can think of commercial obligations as basically just growing out of ordinary promissory obligations, but they're ones that are typically conducted for pecuniary reasons or for reasons of profiting materially in some way. Um, but then it makes sense, right, that the same modes of discharging obligation that you had developed before commerce became a thing would sort of grow into and adapt and morph into modes of obligation discharge that are well suited to commerce as well, basically buying and selling. So in that sense, you could think of buying and selling or commerce as just simple outgrowths of ordinary exchange of other kinds, the kinds that anthropologists have studied for ages, like you know Marcel Mauss's book, The Gift, which is the classic that everybody goes to, um, all sorts of exchange that occur before you get to commerce. So, so that's, I think, the first point maybe worth making because it sort of emphasizes a nice anthropological continuity between money as a commercial vehicle or commercial instrument on the one hand, and money as something more basic than that, something much more rooted in just basic human reciprocity and exchange on the other hand. The other thing worth noting is that when we focus on the commerce aspect of it, we're thinking in terms of stuff that already exists that we're buying and selling, right? So I'm buying stuff that already exists for you, or you're buying stuff that already exists for me. And we have a tendency when we do that sometimes to overlook the productive aspect of economic relations. So the role that money plays in production tends to be very much overlooked and very much underemphasized by mainstream economists. And that's colossally important. Indeed, I think that's probably more responsible than just about anything else for the sort of productive doldrums or uh, sort of malaise that our own economy and our own society has been in for at least 70 years now. So if you think in terms of production, right, if you have an exchange economy that sort of exchange across the board, including um, when it comes to the inputs to production, I have to buy the stuff that I put into productive activity, just like I had to buy the stuff that I would consume. And that means I need means of purchasing or, or exercising claims over resources that go into production. In other words, I need a way of commanding productive resources. And if we have an exchange or commercial economy of the kind that we have, then those means of command are also going to involve the use of money, right? And that in turn means that insofar as the public sector is playing a role in modulating the money system, it ought really also to be playing a role in what I call allocating money, right? In other words, there's an allocative function that has to be discharged along with the modulatory function. So it's not just a matter of how, you know, is there too much or too little, but it's more a matter of, is there too much here and too little there? In other words, is there enough credit money flowing into sectors that need it in order to grow and generate wealth? Or is too much of it flowing into sectors where people are simply gambling on price movements in secondary financial markets or tertiary derivatives markets? That question is easily answered, at least in America right now, just by looking out the window that I'm in, in the, the building that I'm in right now. I'm literally right on Wall Street. And this is where most of the money is flowing. And it's basically being used to gamble on price movements. It's not really going into production. Um, and I think one reason, and that, of course, generates all manner of problem that we're still living with. But one reason it happens, I think, is because we tend to sort of fall back into the kind of Adam Smithian picture or something even pre-Smithian like Robinson Crusoe or something where we're thinking simply in terms of bartering stuff that already exists. And even if we get a little more sophisticated by thinking in terms of using money to buy what already exists, the problem is we're still fixating on what already exists. In other words, we're fixating only on exchange, but not on the production of that which ultimately comes to be exchanged. So that's the other compliment I would add to, to your yeah. contribution. I like to say that the economy will not produce what people don't have the money to buy. Uh, yeah. go, go ahead, Aaron. Oh yeah, I, I just wanted to make a kind of more foundation. I'm really glad you went to the point about production, but just on a foundational point, one thing that in your characterization of initially, Alex, of money, I thought you left out the sort of debt settlement aspect or and payment aspect. I mean, you just didn't mention it, but but it, it turns out to be really important, you know, and like Adam Smith sort of who just talks like we need an intermediate means of exchange and it's gonna be like barter, there's this swapping. 
in the Austrians like Mises, they just talk about means of exchange as though it's the foundational function of money and means of payment uh, is just this secondary or derivative thing. The later more sophisticated treatments of, of or like do, they do a similar kind of thing, but like they, they're just not, they don't have exchange, right? They've got like, because exchange is not like, um, I've got a cigarette, I throw it and it hits you on the head and it, and it lands in your lap. You throw a cigarette, it hits me on the ha head and it lands in my lap. That's not an exchange of cigarettes, right? That's not a swap. That's not even a barter of cigarettes. That's just like assault, you know, joint assault sort of thing. Well, what makes it, yeah, what makes it such that, such that, you know, I'm paying for some, I'm paying uh, you for something. An exchange is like, you have an apple, I want to buy, I buy it. I'm going to give you something so that I acquire title over it, right? That means like, I owe you something for that to happen, right? There's a, there's a debt obligation, right? Um, um, and now we have to negotiate the price, of course, but ultimately I have to settle that. Now, even if I gave you an orange, whatever, in settlement, that's still a swapping of, of so it's my orange, you know, where I'm releasing title, where that's still a debt swap that's that constitutes payment. Now, if we have a money involved, because there's an understood means of payment, then that money, the IOU is substituting for say for the orange, that it's it's settling the debt. You're giving me the apple, I'm giving you the dollar and that settles the debt. So now the apple is mine. So it, you don't really have a purchase or um, um, a sale or exchange in the relevant economic sense, unless you've got an idea of debt settlement. This goes back to Bob's the earlier points about debt and then and something that would settle it. Um, and that's just that point is just totally obscured in like the Smith and and later thinking. Um, and so you you do need a standard to work in the way you mentioned, but it has to be a standard that works to settle debts in exchanges. And then it also has to be able to work in the in the broader way that that Bob mentioned, facilitating productive activities. Yeah. So debt all the way down. It's 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 a means of settling debt. I understood means of settling debt all the way down. That's like its first primordial. Uh, function. Um, this is a way of re-saying something Bob said. So, and the other functions sort of, as it were, are built up store value, you know, things like that are built up as sort of on top of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that kind of the common theme between the just, you know, exchange of goods that are already produced or spot settlement of debt versus, you know, uh, deferred payment is that you have this, this standard, uh, this standard unit that you're setting the prices in, right? Uh, so you talked about uh, a credit debt cooperative before, and you talk about that in the book um, and how that kind of um, shows that maybe the the barter problem wasn't so much a problem because we we originally had you know kind of all these debt obligations to each other um but i still think that the even the debt obligations um it's still the same story right because yeah, you can't you have standard, yeah. you still need the standard exactly yeah. uh, so john hicks in his book a market theory of money uh he says that money is a standard of deferred payment and that you know kind of um you have this this standard unit, and then you have these tokens. Like you guys even say this in the book, you have the tokens that are are representations of 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 what is owed, and and that it's that it's a representation that you it, that corresponds to the standard unit. Um, yeah. So I could go further on this, but um, well, Derek, in our, had, in our yeah, little model, that's the role of favor point. There's favors that first you had exchange, and you're talking about particular favors, but then favors become this sort of more abstract type, right. the unit of account. Then to, to allocate them, there's a like points. So there's favor points. Those are recorded right. on the kitchen ledger, you know, where we're keeping track of who owes right. what. Chore points, I think you call them. Yeah, yeah. chore yeah. points in the unit account. So yeah. that would be that would be the, the, the standard. That's where you're getting the full-fledged money from just not just a means of yeah, debt settlement to full-fledged. Right. So yeah. I think in that sense, you know, the barter story. Um, I know you, you mentioned that um, some people kind of take it literally that, you know, we were, uh, we had this kind of his, history of, of barter and then we discovered money and it solved this problem. I don't think anyone was ever, um, I don't think any of these economics professors were ever um, uh, proposing that that was an actual history and maybe they could have been clearer that it wasn't a, the okay, way they weren't trying to What I meant to say just yeah. now is that what they tend to say is that if you treat money as fundamentally a means of exchange, you can get a good rational reconstruction of why money would emerge from the inconvenience of the market. That's what they, that's what they'll often say, mm -hmm. right? But what I just was claiming was it doesn't even work as a as a rational reconstruction because they, they don't give an analysis of how there's a that means of that settlement that can then function as a standard and then become a means of exchange. So they don't they don't really even give a rational reconstruction of of the essential components. Uh, but maybe the problem isn't that they're talking about this uh, story where you need a, a standard pricing unit. The problem is that the story they're telling is 
is very uh, specific and it doesn't cover kind of the the full need for for that standard. Yeah, or it, 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 they're either assumes the story because they'll talk about means of exchange and then they really would just mean they mean a means of settling debts as as payment mm -hmm. and exchanges. Yeah, and then they'll go and say extra stuff, right? But they act like like but they won't really. <laughs> but they'll talk like somehow the means of exchange just comes out of barter by convention, right? Um, um, sort of the way Smith suggested, but. If they're just going to assume that that's functioning as a means of payment, then they can. But they have they haven't explained the thing that they're supposed to be explaining, right? I think um, it, has to, it has to do with their tendency to sort of fixate on purely material elements of life, yeah. and not the normative elements of life, right? I mean, if you think about it, when we're talking, what they're leaving out um, when they're talking about a barter is the fact that I owe you if you fulfilled your part of the bargain. You know what I mean? When we engage in a promissory, there's this, there's something kind of deeply promissory about even a barter exchange right because it's sort of implicit in that and this gets back to the whole idea of the context or the practice um, that the exchange of money is a sort of the broader context or practice that the exchange of money or anything else is a part of we sort of you know assume that the economists will oftentimes kind of focus almost in a kind of autistic way in a very kind of singular way on just this one isolated you know, cigarette throwing, let's say, right? To use Aaron's example before I toss the cigarette at you and you toss it at me. And an economist is probably oftentimes gonna be speechless when it comes, to, if you ask the economist, why is that not a transaction? Or why is that not an exchange? The economist is probably gonna be speechless because the economist doesn't tend to think in terms of, or just sort of assumes away or just kind of overlooks um, or let's sink into the background a certain social practice that this particular set of actions is a part of. And the practice in this case, if we're trading, uh, we're exchanging, whether it be bartering or for using or, or, or using money, is there's a, there's a normativity that's kind of written into it, right? There's a sort of an implicit bargain between us. There's a mutual obli uh, uh, obligatedness of the two of us then, because you know, you, Alex says, I'll give you this orange for your banana. I say, yes we've in effect made a contract now. And if I give you the banana and you don't give me the orange, you've violated something, you've broken faith, right? And ditto if I don't act. And that normative element is invisible in the sense that it's not another physical element. It's not another piece of fruit, but it's, it's, a, it's a structure that structures the relation between us and that determines the course of the transaction. And money is much more deeply linked up with that kind of, normative structure that structures this context than it has to do with the banana or the orange, right? And that's just an, a longer winded way and probably less clear way of saying that it is fundamentally a matter of discharging obligations. And so it is normative all the way down. It is, there is just, there is right and wrong, so to speak, within a context of this sort. And it's as much a part of that situation as is the height and weight of the, or the heights and weights of the two trading parties. You just can't physically see it. I guess you can't actually see the weight or the height either for that matter. Those are also abstract measures, come to think of it. There you go. Uh, so yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, I just wanted to connect one point that Bob was making earlier, but you could think of what you're doing is sort of, um, we're giving each other what we owe each other, but we're keeping track of that. And you can think of that as a kind of scorekeeping. So a kind of yeah. debt scorekeeping, That's right? The and then we have we we make understandings about what settles debts, and that's sort of a convention within a debt score keeping system. And now mm -hmm. there's ways of like we could keep track of that in our heads, but when you establish a ledger, right, that's making it public just so we can keep sort of for ease of keeping track and avoiding mistakes and stuff like. That. But that's 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 sort of that's the that's the real public representation of the of the underlying normative uh, mm -hmm. relations. What's mm -hmm. cool about that way of thinking about just what would happen in a money in a credit debt cooperative. Or it's a scorping is then you can see how banking quickly is just is just scorekeeping right this debt scorekeeping just entry on book banks governments could take over um, banking systems they could set up their own banking structure why why you could once uh, uh, scorekeeping technology improves so that the representations don't have to run through paper you know <laughs> paper books and then oh, through yeah. computers but but digital ledger tech, why you can just refashion the the, the payment technology the debt uh, scorekeeping technology, and then you know you can refashion the money system in a in a pretty dramatic way. But it's still the money; the money isn't you know there. So and that 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 like uh, that's a really nice that so that fits with the idea of you know going to central bank um, digital currencies. You know, and that's not a fundamental change in in what money has always been. It's just 
it's changing how we represent it, how we organize it, the scorekeeping system. But that's all continuous with what money has always been. It's not that there was this physical stuff, you know, before, you know, and then now we're going to this virtual weird, weird world that's not, you know, it's like. Yeah, the, the physical stuff is the intermediate yeah. stage, right? We yeah. start with the ledger and then we go to yeah. the physical intermediate and then we go to the ledger again. Yeah, yeah. right. Right. So it, it's a way of seeing the. Uh, like, I, I like that. The paper or the, the gold bar or the even the books are sort of these intermediate physical technologies mm -hmm. that um, were never essential. They were just useful. And then once technology progressed, we could sort of, you know, get right. back to what needed it more. Yeah. Yeah. What it, money always was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. Money is still money, regardless of how it's represented. And I think in here, um, when we talk about money, we usually don't worry about, you know, whether it's physical paper or bits and bytes on a computer or gold or whatever. Um, it's usually, you know, you know that uh, money is money. It's the it's the standard token that that people use to claim uh, goods and services. And uh, the way it is, um, the way you can trust that you can claim goods and services that is that it's backed by a promise that it, that it, that it'll um, be able to claim a consistent amount from day to day. Uh, so let's go to Derek. Uh, hi, thanks for coming, guys. This is really, really great. I want to say again, um, um, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if you guys are, are siblings uh, to MMT, then I think, uh, I'm sorry, if you guys are cousins, to MMT, then I think maybe you guys and Alex are, are siblings. Your views are, are, are really close. You both seem to emphasize um, the function of money as a promise, like a government promise, more than uh, a tax credit. And you're also emphasizing that that promise uh, sort of predates or is underneath um, just the government's uh, authority itself. Um, I, I think maybe what some of Alex's questions are getting at is that, you know, is, is money, uh, uh, what is money a specific uh, promise for? Because the, the, you know, in truth, there actually are, like you guys point out, there's a there's a great wealth of promises, obligations, formal and, and informal in our society. I mean, familial obligations, moral promises, social promises. There's a lot of promises that if we tried to fulfill those those obligations with money, our our partners would would be offended. Um, so so money seems to be a promise for something in in particular, and and Alex is, is emphasizing uh, the concept of consumer goods, economic goods that are sort of what we typically expect money to be exchanged for. So I, I guess my question is, you know, if we had a, uh, if we had a, imagined a government or a central bank that pursued, tried to sort of optimize money to fulfill a social or legal promise or a political promise, but in so doing neglected to, to keep that promise, to keep the promise of exchangeability for consumer goods, um, you know, could we consider that currency, could we still consider, consider that currency money? Yeah, or could we still consider that money currency or whatever it is, could we consider it money or currency? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you, you know, it, it's sort of a, it, in one way, in, in one sense, it's sort of a, a, an invitation to adopt a convention, you know, shall we call it money or shall we not, right? I don't know that there's a sort of a determinate or say predetermined answer, but um, if we wanted to be kind of true to the basic vision that I gather that we three siblings um, Alex and Aaron and, and, and Bob maybe share that there's something promissory uh, about money, then what we would say, I suppose, is that um, if, if as long as money was usable um, to discharge particular obligations, um, then it would still be monetary, at least in that sense, right? Um, it, it's, it's noteworthy that economies that have tried to get away from being exchange economies that have been more like sort of ration economies uh, or provisioning economies typically have issued tokens as well, which function as monies, first of all, in a kind of a vertical sense that you use them to basically you redeem them at the commissary. Uh, of whatever authority is doing the rationing, whether that be the army or whether it be a military state, a kind of Sparta. Um, some parts of the Soviet Union at certain times of its history are said to have been like that. Well, there, you know, again, you're using the token in exchange for something else. And, and in that sense, it's functioning in, in a monetary way. If you wanted to kind of um, broaden out your perspective on it, you could say there's still something exchange-like going on here too, because you've presumably done something for Sparta, let's just call it Sparta, you've done something for Sparta to earn those tokens. And now those tokens are redeemable in the form of the goods and services that Sparta rations to its uh, citizens. So it seems to me it would still be monetary in, in that particular sense. And it would still be, it would still involve something 
promissory like, or at the very least, something like mutual obligatedness of the kind that promise itself represents one special case of. In this case, the mutuality would be, I've fulfilled my obligations to Sparta. I put it in my military training. I've killed this many Persians in a battle or something, whatever I'm supposed to do for Sparta. And then Sparta has sort of exchanged for that, which I have given to Sparta, these tokens, which are then exchangeable for the means of material sustenance. And so it, it doesn't seem to me to be a stretch to say it's still money and that there's still exchange and there's still a kind of mutual obligatedness going on. It's just that the site, S-I-T-E, of the exchanging and of the incurring of the obligations is sort of set, is, is sort of moved a few steps away from, you know, market exchange between individuals. Okay, that's a good answer. Let's go to Aaron. Yeah, my, uh, so I, I had, I, mean, I guess I used to think about this, um, I, I mean, one way to think about this is like how money corrupts is sort of a broad question. And I, I suppose I used to think that an old way to think about this problem is there's, there's money like issued by governments and then it corrupts sort of informal social relations. Um, and then you have to put boundaries on it kind of thing. But, but, but now I think that there's a, like a an, an more interesting way of thinking about it, which is there's a lot of different things that can be monies, including government monies. But, um, and then there's a kind of a, you, you might want to protect one money against influencing another. So take, take um, like a household, like a root with where we're roommates and we have this sort of chore economy and we have our ledger and, and it's in chore points and it's within our, you know, we, we have our ways of like offsetting our chore liabilities or getting, getting my roommate Bob to do my, to do my chores for now so I can free up time to do other things, right? So that all functions, but, but imagine that, um, you can imagine that things might go awry in, in sort of the fairness of the household economy might go awry if we allowed background facts about how rich we are in dollars and government money to, to be accepted in discharging our obligations. So suppose Bob's from a rich family, he inherited a bunch of dollars and then I didn't. But now every time, you know, Bob, now Bob, instead of doing his chores, right, um, uh, in the household, he's just constantly giving dollars <laughs> to buy out. Right? Now, like the corrupting aspect is, well, if I'm from the poor family, I'll, I'll accept those dollars and I'll just be doing all of Bob's chores, right? And now you might think, uh, now you might think that's sort of corrupting the, the fairness of our, of our internal household relations. Um, and so we might make a rule just to sort of say, well, dollars don't count. You know, we settle, we settle our chore obligations totally in terms of our household money or chore money. Um, and we don't, let, we don't let our dollars encroach. You know, we we're equals in that regard. You know, whatever, whatever else is true of society in, in our household, our household social contract we're equals before that. And that's our rationale for blocking the influence of money on the settlement of those internal obligations. And so that seems like that's sort of protecting one money against the encroachment of another money where you see both as ways of settling, settling debts. And that seems like a, like a more interesting kind of question about the stakes for why like government money would, might corrupt. So that's certain monies corrupt other <laughs> sorts of debt scorekeeping systems, right? Um, they might corrupt a marriage, but, you know, if government money is corrupt a marriage <laughs> in the wrong way too. But it's not just because it's not just you know corrupting informal relationships. It's 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 one register of for debt scorekeeping versus another where there's sort of stakes attached to it. And we we see this form just a quick quick uh, footnote. We see this form of sort of segregating of monies um, in in all sorts of contexts. Sometimes very formally and sometimes informally. Formally, the easiest case is that of vouchers, right? Oftentimes the public sector will confer vouchers on people for very specific purposes. And it's a violation of law to try to sell your vouchers to quote unquote monetize them, i.e. convert them into dollars. Um, and it's of course also a crime to try to purchase them in that way. And the reason is precisely that, that Aaron just gave. We don't want the one system in effect to be corrupted by the other because we fear that that will compromise its purpose. Uh, a more informal example might be that let's say that you're with your significant other um, and it's just sort of understood that if you do something that kind of rubs her the wrong way or something, you'll make amends in a particular way. You'll give her an extra hug or you'll, you'll do the dishes tonight. You'll do something like extra chore or whatever. You'll do something to make it up to her. Um, but if you were suddenly to say, you know, well, can I just give you $10? <laughs> the, 
there would be something really deeply creepy about that, right? You'd probably find yourself breaking up with this significant other quite quickly. Um, can I just give you a hundred dollars and then will you stop resenting me for having um, snapped at you the other day? I mean, I think you'd be more resented for making that offer than for whatever the original offense was. Um, and that's a sort of an, there's a, a sort of an informal norm, or I think, or a sort of an informal understanding that these are parallel currency systems, as it were, and that the, what's good, what, you know, what counts as money in one uh, system, uh, it shall not be permitted to count in the other. And not only does it not count, but it's almost insulting and dirty. It's kind of reminiscent of prostitution or something to suggest that it would be usable in that other context. Yeah. Uh, Derek likes to say that money is for people you don't know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to, let's call on Bethany or now. Let's go to Bethany. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to bring it back to this question of the government perhaps promising stable currency, but particularly to the applied example of basic income. So I listened to the podcast and one of the interesting things that came up in case not all of you listened to it was this question of how to keep um, purchasing power in the economy stable or to keep inflation down and deflation down uh, with a basic income. And I think the suggestion in the podcast was that you could charge um, interest rate an interest rate or, or provide an interest rate on the basic income rather um, and change that interest rate to encourage more saving or less saving. Um, and I'm curious about that way of controlling spending as compared to other options, I guess, for example, you could modulate the basic income itself, or you could um, just allow prices to adjust. If you thought it was like a one-time shock, you could allow some inflation and then let it adjust. So I'm just kind of curious about, you know, this interest idea versus others, what you think might make the interest idea particularly strong. This is more of a practical question about basic income. Yeah, so I think this is related to, in the book, Aaron and Bob uh, talk about people having citizen accounts at the Fed. So you'd have an account directly at the Fed. And we actually had a whole one of these where we talked about uh, Fed accounts and, um, you know, uh, that whole idea and, and implementing basic income that way. But the idea with paying interest on the... Um, on the money you have in your account at the Fed is very much analogous to the interest that we pay on reserves at banks right now. So we pay interest on reserves so that banks won't lend into the private sector at a rate uh, any less than what they can get from the Fed uh, on the reserves that they hold. Uh, so Aaron, do you wanna uh, follow up on this? Context, but then invite, I wanted to set up a little context and invite Bob to, to discuss the various um, versions of it, but. But this is a key difference from MMT, by the way, because MMT often says, well, look, um, one thing we should do to um, get the economy up to full employment is just have a federal job guarantee, right? And that's not, and as long as the wage is low enough, then that's gonna be deflationary, right? So that's how they sort of try to, try to get you full employment without inflation. And that's, it all rides on that one policy. And then their hostility to basic income is sometimes related. Well, if you're going to do that, plus give people a bunch of cash, right, then that's going to be inflationary because you're already at full employment, right? Okay. So, but what they're not imagining when they do that is other ways of uh, uh, is other ways of managing um, the overall um, supply of money. You know, aside from just standard interest rate policy or interest rate interest on reserves, there's all these other options. Like we all have accounts with the central bank, and then interest rates are paid on those accounts, and you adjust those that to shape spending. So that gives you further resources to make sure that the, um, and so it's, it's when you notice that you can see why it, like having a job guarantee and a basic income payment aren't incompatible because you have these further resources of, of inflation management among others, which Bob can, should riff on. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, sure. So, so you know, there, there are many, many, many tools that, that can be used. And what's kind of wonderful about the, the variety of these tools is that they can not only be used um, in sort of macro modulatory ways, uh, but they can also be used in much more micro allocative ways as well. Um, so when I think in terms of, of uh, accounts with the Fed, I think in terms of digital wallets, uh, Alex, you might've seen the stuff I've been putting out over the last few months on um, digital greenbacks. And uh, basically we would start with treasury accounts and then um, with treasury wallets, and then ultimately uh, migrate them over to the Fed. But one of the cool things about going the wallet route and going the digital route is that you can begin to really fine tune really quickly. Uh, and some of the forms of fine tuning uh, are forms that Aaron and I actually uh, try to lay out or at least elaborate uh, quickly in, in the book as well, right? So 
one tool uh, that was mentioned before is, of course, interest on wallets, right? You can raise, you can raise the rates or lower the rates uh, to sort of help modulate activity. But you can also target, right, particular wallets or particular you know, wallets in particular sectors. If there's, for example, too much activity going on uh, in the financial markets or in the derivative markets, and there's not enough going on, let's say, in certain basic goods markets, um, you might very well then make sort of not only sort of lower the rates on the wallets in the areas where you want to heighten activity, but you also might make infusions, right? You might do sort of helicopter drop like things, except that this is much more sort of pinpointy than helicopter drops. Um, a comparison that I often draw these days is that between, do you, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember when cars had carburetors, um, but you still see them around sometimes, you know, people who drive old 60s muscle cars or 70s muscle cars around to kind of show them, you know, they soup them up and fix them up and make them look good. Those things use carburetors, which are just very kind of crude mixers of air and fuel that then just get sprayed into cylinders in the engine. And they're sort of variously efficient. Um, but, you know, somewhere in the, I guess it would have been in the later 70s or 80s, we began to move in a big way to fuel injection, where you have a separate injector to every cylinder. And this enables you to get much more sort of fine grained, much more sort of precise in where you're directing the flows. Um, and so if we have digital wallets with a central bank administered digital currency, or even a treasury department administered digital currency until the Fed is ready, because it turns out that treasury is more ready right now, the Fed's probably going to take longer to get ready. Um, we can do that kind of thing, right? So we can, again, pinpoint particular areas, we can target particular places where we want more money to be flowing. Uh, we can temporarily impound um, money in certain areas where there looks like there's too much, kind of in the fashion of, uh, of Maynard Keynes uh, in his, you know, how to pay for the war proposal 1940. Um, and then finally, uh, to sort of add even further, you could imagine the Fed engaging in a much more expanded palette of open market operations of the kind that it currently engages it in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, right? So back during QE2, uh, when commodity prices were inflating and fuel prices were inflating, precisely because the Fed was engaging in expansionary monetary policy with a carburetor rather than with a fuel injector, um, a sort of an unfortunate side effect of QE2, which was on the one hand rescuing the economy, was that there was a sort of regressive tax in effect being imposed on ordinary Janes and Joes because the prices of certain commodities and again fuels began to go up. So I put out a proposal at the time just saying, well, why doesn't the Fed just short commodities? The Fed could basically form a portfolio and can engage in short selling of these very commodities to put downward pressure on the price that would then compensate for the upward pressure that QE2 more generally is putting on the price. And it's not it to take much imagination to realize that we, you can expand from this to all manner of systemically important price that we might want to sort of modulate or sort of keep, you know, sort of fluctuating only within a narrow band. Now you don't want to go obviously too far with this and just have like a big orgy of basically the Fed just investing in everything in the world and sort of constantly manipulating the prices of everything in the world. But it doesn't take much imagination to see that there are some prices that are systemically important in the sense that they matter to us for more than just the sort of underlying fundamentals information that they convey. And so you could say, all right, the Fed could do that as well. That's another one of the tools that we, um, that we sort of countenance um, in sort of toward the end of the book. But if you add all of this together, and if you have a modality through which to execute it, that is sort of, that is, that facilitates or is friendly to or accommodates fine tuning in the way that digitization is now enabling, you can see a whole new world of possibility now for public management of the public money system in a manner that really optimizes the functioning of our republic's economy in ways, again, that probably weren't even imagined as recently as five years ago. Yeah, I think one important difference between you guys and MMT is that MMT is pretty down on the Fed. Uh, they do not think the Fed really has the capability of, of keeping prices stable. And they even tend to argue that higher interest rates are inflationary. Um, uh, higher interest rate policy is inflationary, whereas um, conventionally we think of that as, as monetary tightening because it reduces the amount of lending in the private financial sector. Uh, but I think M that's because MMT focuses on more on the overall balance sheet of the government, the overall balance sheet of the private sector, and then the flows between the government and the private sector. Mm -hmm. So obviously, 
payments that the government is paying uh, on treasury securities or even um, reserves in in you know, in ba bank reserves. Um, you know that is a flow of money from the um, from the government to the private sector. Um, so if that's all you're paying attention to, then it looks like something that that might be inflationary. But it's reducing the amount of money creation in the private financial sector because um, it's making borrowing more expensive. Um, so I think, um, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. All right, let me unmute you. A quick point, like, um, I guess about the framing. I mean, MMT is embracing a sort of traditional framing. Think of inflation as just this average of, a, you know, across an economy of a whole bunch of prices, right? Um, and then the Fed's just to sort of just manipulate that aggregate, right? And it's sort of indifferent to where it's, where it's coming from, right? And, and MMT is to some extent accepting that sort of way of traditionally understanding what monetary policy does. And then they say, well, that's not going to do the job. So we have to go to fiscal policy and then trust legislators to, you know, spend wisely and stuff like that. Um, I mean, they'll do automatic stabilizers like a job guarantee. But other than that, I guess they're going to be, you know, responsible. And they get a lot of pushback for that, understandably. Like, well, you're going to trust le these legislators? <laughs> you're know, like, wait, who, which legislators are you going to trust to, like, do inflation management? You know, like, uh, <laughs> like so. Uh, yeah. But so that, but what's, what's, what these proposals show is that that way of framing the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy is just wrong. It's not true that fiscal policy is distributive or allocative and then monetary policy is not. And that's the way you should think about the difference. I mean, maybe at one point in technology or management that was okay, but it's just not, and the new technologies show that it's just not, is that the monetary policy can achieve its monetary goals by doing allocation in these, by fine tuning in these ways, right? I mean, instead of thinking of it like, why wouldn't it target the sector of the economy in which the prices movements are, you know, rising too high instead of like just trying to address the aggregate? Why wouldn't it buy or, or, or short sell, you know, within the particular target to achieve its monetary stability objectives, mm -hmm. right? So it's all it's all from the point of view of price stability. You, it can it needs to do allocation. And now, by the way, it can also advance equity and distributive justice mm -hmm. um, by if if the way, you know, if those, when those all coincide. So, um, and now that doesn't mean that, that the Fed is not always making politically controversial judgments that should be left to the legislature because a lot of these things like systemically significant prices can be reasonably uncontroversial. We give them a mandate to do those reasonably uncontroversial things, you know, at forms of allocation. And then the Fed just does it in a professionalized way, yeah, that's you know, accountable thing. after the fact. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, at some point, I'll I'll, I'll sort of waste my my time and 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 write up a, a basically draw out a theorem that I'll, I'll call the equivalence theorem or the monetary fiscal equivalence theorem. Um, it's, it'd be really easy to do. Actually, it would just be a form of representation theorem. But basically, any fiscal policy can be replicated as a kind of monetary policy, and any monetary policy could be repl replicated as a kind of fiscal policy. The distinction between them at present is kind of accidental, although it's not accidental in the sense of having no reason. It's not like randomly accidental. It's only accidental in the sense that it's not essential. There's nothing fundamental that demands it. But basically what we've done, it seems, is we've sort of thought, well, as a conventional matter, in general, modulatory policy is less controversial than allocative policy. Um, and so it's probably going to be not too offensive to democratic theory or whatever, or democratic values to go ahead and give the modulatory, modulatory task to something like a sort of Supreme Court of finance, you know, something that basically is insulated from the political process to maintain the integrity of the value of the currency. And then when we get any more micro detailed <clears throat> as, for, as far as allocation goes, then that will make that fiscal because that's the province of Congress, which is more immediately democratically accountable, supposedly, uh, and so on. And, and you know, that, that has a certain plausibility maybe 50 years ago or so, because for one thing, the technical tools available to monetary policy effectuators were less than we have now. We have much more, uh, again, much more sophisticated tools coming online. Second, we hadn't really thought enough about the fact that there are more systemically significant prices that we could probably all agree need modulation than just the interest rate, i.e. just the rate on treasuries. So once we realize that there are more systemically significant prices, that also opens the door to being a little bit more amenable to the Feds doing this kind of thing, or in other words, the monetary authorities doing this. And then finally, if we remind ourselves <clears throat> that the Congress is not democratic anyway, um, right? I mean, 
the last I checked, right, I think it was, what was it, uh, the number of Democratic votes cast for Congress members exceeds the number of Republican votes cast for Congress by something like 15 to 18 million people. And yet you have these, major I should say, well, even when Republicans are in the majority there, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, if people, people sometimes complain and say we should democratize the Fed, but the rejoinder, the obvious rejoinder is, yeah, let's democratize the Fed, but how about we start by democratizing Congress? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting a little um, <clears throat> allergy here. But in any event, so I think what we ought to do now is sort of open the imagination of it. We don't have to be dogmatic about it. But what we should do is we should recognize that a lot of what we have traditionally thought of as being either only feasible to fiscal policy or only democratically acceptable to fiscal policy can now be made monetary as well. And in the same way that lots of things that we traditionally think of as being purely monetary policy matters could also be converted to fiscal policy. I often tell my students, um, you know, isn't it kind of funny that we have two issuances, two sovereign issuances that used to take paper form and still do, but also take digital form now. Um, and both of them are effectively monetary, but one is a little less monetary than the other. The one that's purely monetary, of course, is the Federal Reserve note. The ones that are a little bit less purely, but are pretty far along the way toward being monetary are treasury issuances. And one treasury issuance, by the way, or issuance, by the way, is called a treasury note. Um, and furthermore, we have treasury bills. Well, the Federal Reserve note is also called a dollar bill. These are two money forms that are issued by two organs of government. And we ought to ask ourselves, we ought to be more critical, I think, in asking ourselves, why is it like that? Couldn't you consolidate them? Or if you don't consolidate them, couldn't you have more replication of one another's functions? Um, and I think Aaron and I agree that the answer, the short, short answer to that last question is yes, right? So the real question is why and how and when, for what reasons you might do either a full consolidation or at least more something closer to consolidation. A final point here is I've got a big piece that'll be coming out soon called uh, the Capital Commons that actually take seriously the idea of complete consolidation of fiscal and monetary and sort of tries to picture what it would look like. Um, that's not out yet, but what it is out, um, I'll, uh, I'll let you, I'll drop a, a note to you, Alex. And if you feel like sharing the link with people, I'd be thrilled to, to hear from folk, but this is just further, further carrying on um, the sort of thinking that Aaron and I have been experimenting with uh, or sort of preliminarily or provisionally doing in the book. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to seeing that. Uh, I think a lot of people are noticing now that uh, that Fed liabilities are looking like Treasury liabilities because we started paying interest on bank reserves, which now which is roughly equivalent to paying interest on on Treasury bills, right? You know, you could do yeah. one or you could do the other. It's it's kind of the same thing. Um, and you know, my next question before you went on that whole rant was going to be, what's the difference between uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy? So you've already answered that question. So instead, my next question is going to be about basic income and the job guarantee. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, um, what are the, what's the problem that basic income solves? What's the problem that job guarantee solves? To what extent do they overlap? Uh, to what extent do they trade off against one another? And maybe I'll go to Aaron first since, since Bob was just speaking for a little while. Oh, sure. Um, let's see, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> um, basic income versus job guarantee, thoughts? Yeah, I guess, do they trade off against, I guess they probably do trade off against one another, but where exactly the trade off goes just depends on what the sort of, what tools you have for, for inflation management, you know, in place. If you have a lot of those tools ready to go, then you can probably give a minimum wage, you know, job guarantee and then give a higher basic income. Um, Payment. So, I mean, I don't know if I, yeah, like in, you know, it might, uh, but depend. Bob, Bob could probably talk more about how to do that, um, how to think about the trade-off. Um, but, um, um, sorry, yeah. But the other, what are the different point purposes? I mean, the, yeah, the basic income. I mean, job, the federal job guarantee, right? It's just, it's just make, giving people. It's a transition job, right? So then there's like lots of side benefits to having that, right? So that's a key purpose. Keep keeping full employment, but a basic income um, payment has lots of lots and lots of purposes as well. But one thing it does is give people a better option to not working, which is nice, or having a better option for part-time work, 
Um, and so from my own point of view, I think a better social contract, especially with lots of ecological changes, not just pandemics, but climate change. I mean, there's a lot of more work to do for massive you know, <laughs> climate adjustment and stuff like that. But uh, for a better social contract, people have more flexibility, um, for example, to be able to have part time uh, work, you know, have a basic income payment, but then have part time work and be able to have flexible hours and stuff like that. That's good for families. That's good for um, uh, surfing. It's good for artists. It's good for it's good for intellectuals. You know, it's <laughs> uh, so a lot of the other forms of social contribution or production, non monetary production that you might want to encourage. Um, you know, then then there's value for that. I mean, it also improves worker bargaining power. You know, like so if people are less um, desperate to work or whatever, then that might bid up wages um, in the private sector as well. So that might improve the wage prospects in the in the economy over time. Um, I mean, a, a job guarantee would do that too, but that's going to be lower, just sort of, that's going to define the minimum wage, right? So like, and if it's going to be non-inflationary, then it's sort of going to be lower than the private sector. Um, so, but if you want to have a sort of a, a, something that puts a more upward pressure on it, giving people a better option to not working for money, making it a little more attractive, that could be sort of be a way of, of indirectly nudging up uh, wages along with other measures like improving unions or you know, lots of other things that you can do too. But that's obviously like a glaring 50 year now hole in the social contract, um, you know, 50 years of stagnating wages. And um, um, so rising wages is just like the beginning of it, the first part of rectifying Find, find that. So basic income payment is there's, you know, has these multiple sort of roles, but that's, that's one, one piece of it. A lot of other things you have to do to address inequality, but this is the first step of, you know, bringing up the bottom um, to, to, that doesn't fully address inequality and more for that, which we could talk about, but, um, but so that's, that's a, that's a limit on what the basic income, but it's, it'll contribute to that, but it's not the full, it can't be the full story, even with a job guarantee about addressing inequality, but yeah. So, I mean, my own view on, on this is that um, both the job guarantee and UBI uh, are compromises, uh, and they're compromises with a deep fundamental injustice, uh, and they're ways of sort of mitigating this injustice. Um, so I'm using that, 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 that word again. So the fundamental injustice, it seems to me, is this. Um, in order to sort of produce a livelihood for yourself, you have to have access to things that are used to produce goods or services, right? In other words, capital and all non, let's just call capital, all non-labor inputs to production, right? So you've got your labor and then you've got the stuff that you need to use and exercise your labor on in order to produce. Now we live in a society that allows 3% of the population to own the overwhelmingly greater part of those non-labor inputs to production. In effect, in other words, we live in a kind of plantation or hacienda economy. If you just remind yourself that land is no longer the principal input to production any longer, it's physical plant, it's physical equipment, it's all again, all of these other non-human, but also non-landed inputs to production. And we all seem to be cool with um, the idea then uh, that capital hires labor rather than labor hiring capital because there's plenty of labor out there, but there are only a few owners of all of this capital. And there are various ways that we could deal with this, right? One would be to sort of seize all of that non-labor input to production and say everybody has an equal pro rata claim to that stuff so that basically it would no longer be the case that a tiny minority of the population owns all of the plantation land, so to speak, that all of the rest of us are hoping to find ways of laboring on or hoping to get employed uh, to work on. Um, or we could sort of decide to live with things more or less as they are, but try to mitigate them. And one way to mitigate them is through a UBI where we say, okay, look, we're gonna render people less dependent on getting a job with the, the hacienda owner in order to be able to get their livelihood, they will have a birthright in effect to at least some basic or fundamental livelihood. And that, isn't, that is admittedly better um, than a world in which we say, well, not only do 3% of the population own all the hacienda land, um, but you don't get to eat unless the hacienda owner agrees to hire you to cut the sugar cane or whatever, right? So it's definitely an improvement, um, but it's a compromise in the sense that 
going to the real root of the problem, I think, would be seizing the hacienda and saying everybody owns a hacienda, whether that mean collectively or, you know, parceling it out in small parcels like the Gracchi brothers would have done uh, in the Roman Republic. But that's one way of, that's one form of compromise with, with this, I think, fundamental injustice. Um, the job guarantee can be viewed, among other things, as another way of compromising with it. Now you say you don't have a right to a basic sustenance so that you don't have to work for the hacienda, uh, hacienda owner for it, but instead it's that you get to work for somebody. You, know, you have a guaranteed right to work for somebody, maybe for the public, uh, in order to earn that livelihood, which is also better than having to depend on the good graces of the hacienda owner. But depending on it, it sort of how much better it is would sort of depend on again, how democratic is the process of the hiring? Is the state itself a democratic state so that you can view the job guarantee as a kind of, you know, uh, self-employment by the, you know, sort of a, a kind of collective self-employment? Uh, or is it in fact just, is it treated more like a kind of, well, here's some make work for you. We're gonna give you some benefits, but we're gonna make you work for them, which is certainly something that the job guarantee could degenerate into. In other words, uh, the, you know, wrongly done, the job guarantee could easily degenerate into work fair, which I don't think many people view as a, as a satisfactory uh, sort of situation either. So my own view in consequence is first, go you know, work on that fundamental injustice, which is what my next book is on. It's called The Republic of Owners. But in the meanwhile, while you're on the way there, why not have both UBI and JG, um, but again, use them for somewhat different purposes, which you also, I think, invited us to sort of, uh, sort of say, Alex. So I, I won't say too much more. I don't want to be too long-winded, but I mean, basically it seems like it's fairly straightforward to say, look, everybody has a right to some sort of basic income, whether they work for it or not. You do have a birthright claim on some pro rata share of society's wealth. And a UBI payment of 500 bucks a month is probably much smaller than your rightful share. 1,000 might also be smaller than your rightful share, but it's at least something and it's, it's better than nothing, unless of course it actually you know, takes the wind out of the sails of revolution, which might be a problem, but I'll leave that to one side as a sort of a practical question. Um, and then when it comes to the JG, uh, the JG is sort of uh, partly about doing the same thing. In other words, it's partly about rendering people no longer dependent on the good graces of the hacienda owner being willing to hire you or not. But it also has some other possible purposes, one of which Aaron uh, referred to, and that's the sort of stabilizing idea. You can also think of it as something that might raise the floor. It's a kind of public option sort of situation in that case, where you're basically in a public option for employment gives society or the public an, a convenient way through which to impose basic standards, minimum standards for labor, uh, including pay, but also working conditions and the like, because as long as there's an option that's publicly provided that's superior to the lowest, say, you know, the worst private alternative, people will leave that private alternative and take the public option instead. So given that the purposes even though overlapping are somewhat distinct, or at least are separable, uh, or at least they're not fully coextensive, it seems to me that you know we should just do them both while recognizing that they are both specific compromises with the fundamental injustice that we ultimately want to address, which is again, this crazy maldistribution of the ownership of non-labor inputs to production. <clears throat> well, I'm happy to hear that you're still working on a Republic of Owners. I don't know if you remember, uh, but the first time we met was back in 2018 when you came to a conference here at, at Harvard Law School. Yeah. And, uh, and that was the book you were talking about at the time. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that when that comes out. Yeah, I've got the manuscript ready, Alex. So I'll send it to you within the next month or so. If, if oh, you fantastic. Would, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love your comment. I'd, I'd love to take a look, yeah. Um, so I liked... Um, what you said about labor hiring capital versus capital hiring labor. Uh, and the question I have to that is what about consumers hiring labor and capital? So if you have a basic income, then consumers are the ones with the money and they're the ones who do the hiring, whether they happen to be workers or they happen to be capital owners or they happen to be neither. 
neither of those things, right? Um, so I think you know, basic income can certainly help uh, get the economy working, uh, working for the benefit of the people. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the problem that basic income solves, I like to say that uh, in order for the economy to function, people need money so they can buy stuff. And then what do we want the mechanism to be to get money into people's hands? Mm -hmm. And traditionally, we expect people to, to earn their money through jobs. But the labor market fundamentally is, is a market for getting people to do things. And we're kind of using it as this tool for funneling money to consumers. And that feels like it's distorting it away from efficiency to me. Mm -hmm. and, and by the same token, you know, if we think about um, you know, the unstable financial sector and the business cycle, you know, the booms and busts, um, we stimulate the financial sector to make borrowing really cheap so that businesses uh, can get easy money and then hire people and then create jobs, right? So it's kind of all connected. We overstimulate the financial sector and distort the financial sector away from stability. And that distorts mm -hmm. the labor market away from efficiency. So if you, if you raise the basic income high enough, that allows us to raise interest rates and, and maybe do these other kinds of uh, monetary tightening tools, some of, the, some of the ones you talk about in your book. Um, so we're getting toward the end here. Uh, I wanna go around and get people's final thoughts uh, but only from people who have their hands up. So if you have your hand up, uh, we'll call on you to get final thoughts. Okay, a couple more hands just went up. Uh, so we'll start with Derek and then we'll go to Austin. Uh, yeah, again, thank you. This was really interesting, really fascinating. I could listen to you guys talk for, for hours more. Um, just on that final point of, of, you know, sort of what problem does basic income solve? I mean, I, I think that um, if we were, to, there's many sorts of injustices going on in this world. We could, we could, that's certainly one of them, um, the ones that you talk about. But, but I think, I think, you know, it is, I tend to look at the, the problem that basic income solves fundamentally is as poverty, uh, specifically unnecessary poverty. We live in a very prosperous economy there's clearly a lot of potential for a higher basic income and less poverty. And I guess from my perspective, irrespective of, of, what, uh, of what injustices there, there are, and, that, and then also the debate about what they are and then how to, how to attack them or correct them, um, I would hope that just as a baseline, we're, we're reducing as much poverty as possible. We're, we're making the poorest person in society wealthier because why wouldn't we want to do that if, if you could and it was simply a matter of giving them more money. Um, I really like the talk. I'd really love to hear you guys talk more about this, this idea of using interest rates um, on the basic income accounts uh, as a kind of way of calibrating the basic income or as a way of, of, of uh, protecting against inflation, because uh, that's really interesting. And I haven't, I haven't heard people talk about that. Um, so thanks again. This was really interesting. Okay, let's go to Austin and then Bethany. Hey, um, yeah, fantastic conversation. Um, I want to say that I really agree with a lot of the, especially the Zoom, when we get down to actually what should be done, stuff like Federal Reserve wallets or whatever, although I think the IMF should do it for everyone on the planet. Um, but I uh, was thinking, I wanted to jump way back a little bit because it's actually the sort of zoomed out um, philosophical picture, which I think is, I have a little bit more of a question about. And so it... Well, a lot of what you guys are saying about the sort of obligation, obligation is debt, debt is money kind of stuff, reminds me of David Graeber. Um, but I think there's a difference, and I'm not, I'm not sure how much of a difference there is. Um, but the difference is that he, in his book, he, he really talks about there's two kinds of obligation. There's, a, there's an egalitarian obligation sort of between equals in, in, within the village, so to speak, um, which might be a little bit idealized, but it's, it's how he presents it. Um, and then there's a hierarchical obligation between the ruler and the ruled. And what's interesting about, um, for me, MMT is that they seem, I, they seem to be um, right that there's this hierarchical obligation and that money is actually a sort of trick to get people to do things. So you guys use the example of Sparta and how you fight for Sparta and then Sparta uh, in total has an obligation to you, right? So in David Graeber's picture, you fight for Sparta, you get a coin um, the peasants owe the government that coin, so the peasants actually pay back your debt to the government. So you do something for the government, the peasants do something for you, or the peasants get killed, right? That's, the, they, the, that's Graeber's picture. And so there's this top-down obligation system enforced by violence, and then there's an informal or illegalitarian uh, obligation system. And, you know, the history of modernity is the history of the top-down one eating and destroying the bottom up grassroots one, which is why I believe in a basic income. 
to sort of counter that and sort of have a, give everybody a claim on that system. So it's not just that the system has a claim on the individual. Um, and I wonder if, I think that the, the, the example that where it's most stark is the international system where we all use the US dollar and that is pretty much purely based on force. There's almost no element of um, uh, egalitarian or equal f or, or some deal made on equal footing. It's a situation where um, uh, the, the, the hierarchical monetary, hierarchical force behind money um, is uh, most sort of naked. And I, I really would have liked to get more of the guys' comments on that so maybe they can touch on it in their, in their closing remarks. Okay, great. Let's go to Bethany and then we'll go to Aaron and Bob for final thoughts. Whoops, Bethany moved. There we go. Hey, um, so thanks. Uh, like everyone has said, this has been a great discussion. Uh, I guess I'll just end with a couple of questions that were on my mind during the discussion. So one has to do with, um, I think you guys were talking about keeping the prices of specific things stable. And it's just something I'd like to understand a little bit more because I wonder if there's a difference between keeping the general price level stable um, and keeping individual type things uh, stable in the sense that you might lose maybe more market information or um, other things that are important by targeting specific prices, but I could be wrong about that. So that's one question. Um, and then the second question has to do with the jobs guarantee and basic income. And I think I heard people talking about potentially having both. And I guess I just wonder um, kind of what the added value of a jobs guarantee is, particularly in light of the fact that if you're guaranteeing a job, you're presumably not just trying to get the most work done with the least labor possible, or you would just incidentally hire as many people as you needed, possibly everyone who wanted it, possibly not. But if you're guaranteeing the job, it seems like that's definitely pushing things in the direction of um, wasting people's time or some kind of make work, um, no matter how much you try, because otherwise, you, like I said, you could just hire the labor that you need. So I, I guess I wonder what the thoughts are on that and um, and why you would, what value would, would a jobs guarantee add in addition to a basic income? So I don't necessarily have to answer those, but those are kind of my final questions that came up in the discussion. So thanks so much. Okay, thanks, Bethany. And I'll throw a couple more questions out there. Uh, so based on what Austin said, we can ask if money is debt, who is the lender? Who is the borrower? What is being lent and borrowed? And then based on what Bethany said, we can say, we can ask, when is it useful to think of inflation and deflation as a property of the currency itself versus a phenomenon occurring in individual markets? Uh, so Aaron, go ahead first for final thoughts. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see, um, for starters, um, Republicanism, small r. So I, I very quickly alluded to a sort of Republican argument and Bob really elucidated a Republican arg argument um, where, you know, there's this, there's an idea that we're at bottom fundamentally equals and, um, and there's an important problem about being subject to the, to the well arbitrary will of other people, um, you know, the good graces and, and, and especially in hiring and, you know, our basic sort of, you know, um, needs of life. And there's a real issue issue there. So I think that's a, that's a sort of, you can understand that um, as already a kind of deeply egalitarian um, idea, right? Um, 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 so that, that means that, that to get to the hierarchy versus more egalitarian idea. So that, that means that if we start out as equals in status, aside from sort of who has what resources, but then there's this presumption against establishing hierarchies that give people ability, one certain party's ability to dominate another, then there's a strong burden of justification against those hierarchies. So in favor of more reciprocal egalitarian ones. So those are by default fine. Hierarchies might be justified for special reasons, but then we wanna see what those reasons are, why they work out to be okay for from everybody's point of view, why they're acceptable, right? So that's the way you might think, starting from a sort of fundamentally small r Republican egalitarianism, You that would be sort of, that would be a version of that was a way of putting the thing that Bob was talking about, and and um, um, and then you can think of. Um, but now there's a question like when it comes to not historically money would like how money fits into that would depend on the context, um, but within the American context, you can see at least given you know what the the way that our central bank our banking system has evolved, it's got some like high, it's got hierarchical elements, but it also has um, maybe more egal potentially egalitarian elements um, as well. Um, and so, but if you think of, if you think of the, the, 
if, if we're some fundamentally supposed to be a republic of equals, if that's a founding principle of American democracy, and um, the Federal Reserve really just is issuing in charge of our full faith and credit, it's our money, right? Then um, it's an agency on our, all of our behalf where its fundamental responsibility is to treat us all as equals. Then you can see how it can, it can sort of move in a, in, a, in a much more egalitarian direction consistent uh, with our basic claims as equal citizens, right? And now you might think, oh, that requires a lot of tax and transfer and stuff like that. That's a sort of traditional post Rawls frame. The debate between libertarians and Rawlsian liberals was often posed as a question of like, well, there's inequalities and how are you gonna tax the rich so that you can bring up the bottom, All right? Um, um, but that's, that's a, a bad frame once you think about the way the monetary system works and the possibilities of remaking the monetary system in a more egalitarian direction. Because then what you you can do is not just bring up the bottom by giving paying a basic income grant. Um, you can also, um, you know, do capital grants or you can, you know, like, you know, baby bonds and stuff like that. You can do much more, much deeper sort of reallocations of capital to make a more, much more egalitarian system of property where ta the role of taxation is something different, right? It's, it's different functions. It's not raising the funds in order to, to create the, the, the better initial endowments, right? Um, that can be done more directly. And um, so like you, you, just working with what we have, you get, you get closer to an a sort of Republican egalitarian um, ideal. Um, and the, but he, just a, one little point then about the job guarantee um, there is that even though I'm like, I'm kind of, I'm a surfer and I grew up trying to like maximize my time ability to surf <laughs> and then within in a world that doesn't care about how much how much you surf and just like, you know, like is expecting you to make money and has a, like a aggressive work week, you know, with like non-flexible hours and like, okay. So like, that's the world I grew up, you know, so my sympathies are with people who want, who like want free time. And so basic income frees up your time and you're not beholden you know, to the man in that way. But that's, but also my other hat is I'm a philosopher and I like doing work. I like doing philosophy, like, you know, I get paid, it turns out being a professor to like, you know, to write, work on papers and read books and I do ideas. So, um, so, okay, it turns out work is a pretty cool, can be a, for money, can be a pretty uh, great exercise of skill that's enjoyable and, you know, um, wonderful in, in lots of the similar ways that surfing is, for example. Um, but a lot of people feel that way about about their about their jobs, right? About or about work, doing lots of valuable things. So, you know, I wouldn't want to have a sort of anti-work bias built into, or an anti-work for money bias. You know, that's like wonderful, lots of wonderful ways of contributing to society. Um, so, um, um, so I would think a job guarantee helps for people that are of that disposition who want to put together a better, a good work-life balance, and they want to be able to work money. They're not be as beholden to the private markets. And whatever you know, the, whatever the businesses or the capitalist jobs are offering at the time, they're less beholden to that because there's potentially meaningful work that can be done in the in public sector employment, always available, hopefully flexible part time as well. And now, if that that we wouldn't want that to be make work per se, right? But if that is like, uh, if that's doing things, you know, in the direction of a green new deal, you know, then that's about as meaningful as it gets, right? If you're helping to decarbonize you know, in, which requires all kind of like massive, you know, new kinds of like productive activities. So, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have a bias against like against work per se, right? Is, is even being this surfer that I am. <laughs> so that, that leaves room for it. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Hey, thanks. So I'll take those, uh, uh, the questions or final remarks kind of quickly and in order. Uh, so starting with Austin, then um, my own view, I guess, for what it's worth is that there is uh, inevitably, I mean, it just comes, it's sort of built into the structure of human sociality, that there's a sort of horizontal dimension and a vertical dimension to it. The horizontal dimension is just our sort of interacting with each other, right? The things that we do with each other, to each other, that we receive from each other, that we give to each other, um, and, and so on. Um, the vertical element comes with, I think, the normativity that is sort of written into those relations that we have with one another. Um, and the question then only becomes, is the, the only question becomes, is the sort of enforcer or the way in which that normativity is enforced uh, 
um, done abusively or exploitatively, or is it done in a way that can be coherently or uh, plausibly ascribed to the wills of the individuals who make up this polity, right? So now I'm going kind of Rousseauian. Um, and I think in a way, in the, in the Rousseauian money thing that I mentioned before, you can kind of map the vertical dimension onto the collective we, right? The first person plural. And then you can map the horizontal dimension onto the first person singular, right? So I, Bob, and you, Alex, we're sort of in our individual or our, what the lawyers would call our several capacities relate to each other on this kind of horizontal dimension. But there is a normativity in our relating. I can wrong you. I can violate your trust. I can harm you. I can break faith with you in various ways in my relating to you. And insofar as I do that, I'm basically flouting a norm that is sort of over both of us. It's a kind of, that's where that vertical dimension comes in. And you can think of that norm as in being in some sense, the product of the two of us in our collective capacity as a kind of we, because this is what we would expect of ourselves as a, as a, as a, as a sort of a dyad. Now, the, the ideal of a republic, it seems to me, just is the ideal of a polity where that collective we is very much in sync with all of the individual we's who constitute it, right? That first person plural is deeply in sync with the first person singulars who all jointly constitute it. And in that sense, then the vertical dimension is in sync with the, the, the just claims of every individual who's relating to other individuals along that kind of horizontal dimension. Um, and that's what a republic would be. And anything that falls short of that is in one way or another tyrannical. And so these particularly egregious forms uh, that Austin was describing um, as being in the Graeber book, which I am somewhat ashamed to confess not to having read, um, would it be in my view would be sort of degenerate forms of republics, right? They would be degenerate forms of polity or of, 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 first, of, of first person plurality, right? The we who constitute the polity that is dominated by this, this tyrant or whatever are really little more than hostages. They're little more than victims of a gangster or something. But insofar as they nevertheless think of themselves as still being Spartans or still being um, uh, Persians or whatever uh, ancient polity they would have considered themselves members of, there's still a kind of rump first person plurality. There's still a kind of a rump we, but it's a deeply distorted, twisted sort of we, because the right kind of we is one in which every individual I is sort of, is still equal in, in representation uh, and in um, a sort of principlehood relative to the agency that is the polity uh, to all of the other individual eyes. Very abstract and, and probably very hippy dippy sounding. Um, but that's sort of the way I tend to look at things. And therefore when, when Austin describes all of this sort of force stuff or this violence stuff, I think, yeah, I mean, I'd be a fool to deny that that happens uh, or to deny that that's been the dominant uh, story of history. Um, um, but I also think I would be um, I think un I wouldn't be true to myself and to what I think is actually the trajectory of history over over time, even though it sometimes is two steps forward, one step back. If I were to say it's nothing but that, and if I were to claim that there's not a kind of by fits and starts halting progress toward larger and larger spheres of uh, domains being um, uh, sort of ruled by republics rather than by simple tyrannies or, or monarchies or, or, or what have you. Um, uh, getting to Bethany's question about um, the sort of targeting of individual um, markets or uh, sort of doing uh, kind of modulation within particular price areas. Um, you know, this is sort of, in, in a way, what Bethany is putting her finger on is something that I was sort of trying to duck before when I said, well, of course, you don't want like an orgy of the Fed sort of determining every single price out there. Um, basically, what we need, I think, is sort of principled means of determining what prices should we act on collectively rather than simply leaving subject to quote unquote, you know, untrammeled market forces in which prices should we more or less allow uh, to be determined by, by market forces. And it's, it's not too difficult, I think, to kind of come up with principal means of deciding these things, right? For one thing, markets that depart far and far, you know, the farther away a market uh, becomes from the sort of Aero de Bruvian ideal where everybody's a perfect price taker and nobody's a price maker, 
you already have a reason right there to begin to sort of intervene. But furthermore, some prices are more important than others in the sense that they become inputs to other prices. And so they can become systemically significant. And that's the reason that we have the Fed charged with price fixing, basically, when it comes to the money rental rate, also known as the interest rate. That's simply a systemically important price that we just think we don't want to leave to market forces because otherwise it swings too volatilely, which really has a way of screwing up people's plans. And it makes it pretty difficult then to have an economy at all. So you have to keep it collared, to use the financial term. You have to keep that price collared within certain bounds. Um, and it has to stay within that amplitude, right? And the idea is that stabilizes the system broadly. And then people can actually make plans around it. And then private ordering actually becomes possible because we have publicly provided for a certain kind of background condition whose stability is a prerequisite to effective uh, private ordering on the part of all the rest of us. As soon as you sort of formulate that thought, then it's pretty easy to sort of see that there's some other prices that also have that characteristic. Prevailing wage or salary rates might very well be one because labor is an input to so many other things. Energy prices like petroleum or other commodity prices oftentimes are inputs to other prices. And then there are certain indices out there like LIBOR or like the Dow Jones or like the S&P that serve as benchmarks and thus become in effect inputs to other prices. And when you look at those that you can sort of see, well, there might be some circumstances under which it makes sense for us as a republic, you know, as a polity collectively to collar those prices, not to, do, not to fix them, but at least to collar them so that the fluctuations are kept within certain boundaries so that then you have, again, the stable background conditions that are requisite to all of our being able individually to plan our lives coherently without thinking that, oh, you know, what if everything is upside down tomorrow? What if tomorrow we're all on fire or tomorrow everything costs 10 times what it used to or whatever? Um, so that's basically the way I approach that. There's a nice piece that, uh, or I, I shouldn't say this, I, 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 it, the nice bit is all thanks to my co-author, um, but a, a dear friend over in Israel and I um, uh, published a piece just called Just Prices just a couple of years ago um, that's on my SSRN uh, page, and I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants, that basically tries to approach this question systematically, try to figure out where does it make sense to intervene? Where are there good justice reasons and where are there efficiency reasons uh, to intervene and where are there not? Um, so I would maybe recommend that. Um, and then I think, um, oh, the other thing that Bethany asked about was the, uh, you know, what does the job guarantee add? I myself um, probably, I probably lean more toward UBI than toward JG if I had to choose between them. Um, given that fact, then I suppose what does JG add becomes particularly important because if it doesn't add anything, I shouldn't be for it at all. I think one thing it maybe adds um, is that if we are still going to have employment out there, if the, if the employment ratio, uh, relation is going to continue, and there's no reason we have to accept that, by the way, the labor movement in the 19th century was all about eliminating human rental, i.e. the wage system, which they viewed as only just slightly better than human ownership, i.e. slavery. This is what the Knights of Labor were all about. It's what the Wobblies were about, was ending the system of wage slavery. I would ideally do that. <laughs> That's part of what I was getting at with the Republic of Owners thing. But if we keep, uh, uh, if we keep a sphere of, of economic activity where we have the employment relation, then we might have a good reason to try to influence conditions in a manner that uses carrots rather than just sticks, right? The sticks, of course, are labor law. But as we know, reactionaries always end up getting control of the uh, enforcers of labor law. So labor law, or they co-opt the labor unions, and so the union bosses become managers themselves, and so they don't really care about labor. Um, so it seems that we might want, as a sort of alternative or as a sort of supplement, to relying on sort of external sticks to optimize the uh, labor conditions of those who continue to labor in the private sector to offer a public alternative, a sort of, again, a public option to try to optimize those conditions. But e even that I feel a little hesitant about saying, because of course, if the, if the UBI is high enough, that just is the public option. The public option is, fuck this, I'm going surfing, right? So, you know, I, I, I'm a little ambivalent, let's say, even about the, the few good things I'm sort of saying here um, about, about JG. Uh, finally, on Alex's uh, uh, question, the one that the, is sort of funny question about, well, who's the uh, obligor and who's the obligé, right? Who's the debtor and who's the creditor? Um, I think, you know, again, because a public money is simply something into which we convert private monies, 
namely our private promissory notes, right? When you take a, a loan out from the bank, you're basically swapping your private promissory note for a public promissory note. The reason you do that, of course, is because the public, public promissory note counts as a claim on resources everywhere. In other words, everybody accepts the Federal Reserve note, but not everybody accepts the Alex note. I would, all of us here would probably accept an Alex note, but maybe people down in Philadelphia wouldn't. Um, and so what Alex has to do if he needs to uh, get the secure claim on resources to make money in some way or to be productive in a way that enables him then to pay back the money later um, is he has to sort of temporarily swap his individual promissory notes for the public promissory notes. What that means in turn is that in a certain sense, the promissor is the initial issuer, which would be Alex in this case, right, the borrower. But then in a derivative sense, the promissor is the public because the public is saying, yeah, this dollar bill here will basically, this is our way as a public of standing behind Alex's creditworthiness. We, the public are saying, we will back up Alex by essentially al allowing banks that are authorized to create money that is denominated in dollar terms uh, on Alex's behalf. Um, but of course, again, to sort of on a closing note, all of that only works because we do it through a bigger system that's not just the Fed, it's also the legal tender laws, it's the bankruptcy laws, it's the debt collection laws, it's all of the rest that sort of constitutes this entire system of sort of circulating um, um, represented credit um, known as, as, as money, whether the, whether the representation be a ledger entry or a token or a slip of paper of some sort. I hope that's responsive to you, Alex. Yeah, that's great. And like Perry Merling likes to say, all banking is a swap of IOUs. Uh, yeah, I, so yeah, I think that's, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so thanks so much for coming on, you guys. This discussion was fantastic. Uh, next week, we're talking about um, resource conservation. And we have uh, seven featured guests, one of whom just showed up as as Bob was giving his uh, closing remarks. So Peter Barnes is gonna be there. Uh, oh, Peter, Peter actually, yeah, Peter actually Peter. emailed me a couple weeks ago and he we said- years ago. <laughs> we, 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 hey, yeah, Peter, sorry, I don't, sorry to interrupt, but we just, Peter and I just did a Zoom on Friday. Hey, Peter, <laughs> back to you, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Peter emailed me a few weeks ago. He said, um, uh, hey, check out this new book. Uh, it sounds like a lot of the things that, that you like to talk about. And I said, actually, we're having the authors on uh, Boston Basic Income a week before we have you on. Uh, so that kind of all connected Peter, up. Meet Aaron, the co-author. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is Aaron. Uh, so I'm going to end the live stream now, and then I'll allow people to unmute themselves. Uh, thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks, guys. Okay. Now.